Just on the subject of late effects, I once received a lovely letter from someone saying, your patient has applied to medical school. I understand this is probably a late effect of her leukemia treatment. <laughs> she swore it wasn't. She said she'd been interested beforehand. So I've come to talk today about paediatric palliative care. And I swear I did this slide before I realised that was the last talk. Palliative care isn't something you should leave right until the end. I'm quite happy to be right at the end today, but I just want to point out palliative care isn't the service you bring in when you run out of other options and everybody else has done what they can. It's not just about end of life care. Palliative care needs to be continuing multidisciplinary care for the child and family who's living with life-threatening illness. It can actually coexist alongside curative and life prolonging treatment. A lot of people think you have to have agreed that there's no more treatment options, that your child will never go to intensive care and have someone to do not resuscitate for. That's a complete misunderstanding. We always talk about lifelong palliative care, which should be there from the start, from diagnosis, to support children and families throughout the illness trajectory. So palliative care is very much an active approach to management and the focus is on improving quality of life and health for children and their families. What we should be providing palliative care is good symptom management, looking at practical support for families, emotional support, spiritual support and where necessary bereavement support. And as I said before, this is throughout treatment from the time of diagnosis. So who makes up the palliative care team? Well, although I work within a palliative care team, no single team can provide all the services a family need at the time they need them, in the place they need them. So obviously palliative care teams need to work alongside the other professionals. So we work alongside hematology and oncology teams as well as local services so that between us all we can deliver the package of care that the child and family need. And some of the dedicated palliative care teams might include a children's hospice team who might provide residential and outreach support, <coughs> a hospital-based palliative care team which ideally will also provide outreach in the form of home visits. It might involve community-based palliative care teams or lead palliative care nurses within a community nursing team. Just getting the right people from the right teams together to support the child and family because as I said before, there's no one team that can do everything all the time. If we're thinking about practical support, again talking about research, there's lots more research we need to do to see what support do families really need and want. What they tell us is practical support is the thing that can help the most. Things like child care. Can you actually get a babysitter for a child with a nasogastric tube or a child who needs some medications at a particular time? Really difficult. So what we say to our treatment parents don't go out. You stay always at home with your child, you don't get even half an hour to go out for a walk with a partner or a friend. So we can look at what organisations around to help with childcare, support with siblings. You might need help with the school run. People don't like to ask their friends all the time to be helping them. Actually nice if we can say, hey, there's a charity that actually can do this for you. We can organise a school run for you once or twice a week. Making sure children have access to planned leisure, we always forget that. We think about getting to treatments, getting to school, we don't think about the fun side of life. Playing leisure is a vital part of childhood for siblings who will miss out when you've got a child being treated, and also for the child who's being treated. Financial support, practical support at home. If so many parents say, I don't actually want someone to come and look after my child or look after the siblings, I want the time to look after my other children. What I need is someone to come do cleaning. Can someone help sort that? And short breaks, sometimes families want to use the local hospice just to actually go away for a weekend to somewhere different and someone else look after you, cook your meals, and make you actually feel, help you to feel human again. Um, access to education is something that I feel very strongly about. Um, and as my children's teachers get very upset about, I'm always saying the least important part of school is education. School is much more than education. It's an essential part of childhood and attendance or ongoing involvement with the school community helps children to maintain their friendships, maintain social opportunities, to continue feeling valued, to have that little escape, escape from illness, escape from a stressed family, just actually to get into school and just be an ordinary kid for a little while. So we work very closely in palliative care services with schools and it's an area that we've been doing some research in as well, looking at what do schools want to know? What support do schools need so that they can support these children in school? And what's the best way to deliver that support? And very interestingly, one of um, the, we did a survey about a year ago 
asking teachers what did they find the most useful form of learning for them. And to my horror, about 70% of secondary school teachers found information leaflets that they had to read themselves the least helpful form of education for them. They don't want to do self-directed learning. 100% want to someone just to come to the school, tell them what's going on, and then they're fine. And they want us to do that within school hours, because they say they're doing enough outside school hours, they can't take on extra stuff. So we often go into schools to look at individual healthcare plans. Every child with illness <coughs> must have an individual healthcare plan. Um, we need to make sure they've got one, and then it applies for routine medical care, routine things that might come up in school and emergencies. Whose children have personalised timetables? Any child with an illness needs to have a personalised timetable. We need to look at, with the school and with the child and the family, what lessons should they be in for? What are priority lessons for the child? What are doable lessons? And actually, what's the most important thing? Sometimes the personalised timetable means going in in time for the lunch break, staying for the lunch break, and then coming home. And that might be the most important thing in the only part of school that child can manage for a little while. But that is so important. That's much better than sitting through double science if you hate double science. Much better than sitting through English. That's the thing that really matters to the children, getting in for lunch break. Support for siblings. It's so important that as um, cancer services and county care that we're supporting schools to support the siblings because they, they just get missed. They look like they're coping fine often, they're okay in school. Does school really know what's going on? I visited a school of a child who, a sibling, a sibling being excluded from the school, her sister was actively dying, and the school said, well, we knew she was ill, she'd been ill for two years, so we didn't really feel it changed, even though we'd written and told them. You know, they really needed to understand. Support for staff. Staff are terrified of looking after sick children. They're frightened of cancer. They're frightened of things happening in the classroom. They need help to be able to look after these children in school. And of course, they might need help to support other students as well. I'm um, really often talking way too much, I have to speed up all my other slides, but education, as you probably guess, is something that I really, really think is so important. I probably shouldn't call it education, I should call it school. I love schools, but not for the, not for the teaching, the boring stuff. Symptom management. Good symptom management, absolutely essential to good cancer care. So, you know, just as oncologists and hematologists are specialists in knowing what drugs you treat cancer with, let's use the specialists in knowing what drugs you treat symptoms with. You know, as palliative care services, we need to be anticipating symptoms, we can do that. We often know what drugs will cause what symptoms. Let's anticipate symptoms, get clear written guidelines that parents and professionals can follow ahead of your child having intractable vomiting. We want to know how we're going to treat it when it happens. Make sure people have got the right meds at home so the parents can actually start giving the medications when the symptoms start happening. And let's try and reduce hospital admissions that are for symptom management. Let's make hospital admission for symptom management a last resort. Obviously, some of the children we look after will experience disease progression. And that's when we need to talk with families, often with the young person, and also with the oncologists about what to expect. We need to give parents the opportunity to think about their treatment options, talk them through. Some might want support to access early phase trials. So particularly if they're going to be travelling abroad, or they're going to need lots of investigations. Again, that's something palliative care teams can help with. We can help with organising travel abroad, we can help with sorting out the investigations you need. And very important at this stage that we make sure families have 24 hour access to really good symptom support. I think it's really important that families should be able to contact a professional who knows their child or has fast access to appropriate information and updated plans any time of the day and night. You should be able to pick up the phone and say, this is my child, and for some to say, oh yes, hold on a sec, I've got all her information here. Um, yep, I know exactly, you're on this drug, this drug, this drug, and sort out what it is that you need. You don't want to be phoning, leaving a message, wondering if someone's going to phone you back. Someone saying, oh, well, just tell me again, because we can't get access to the notes. It's going to spend half an hour going through history, we've done a million times already. You want actually just to speak to someone, <coughs> to look at your child immediately, and know where you are. Um, we also need to think about support for care planning in situations where curative or life prolonging treatment fails. And very important, we support children and families to make choices that are right for them. We need to think with families about what medical interventions might be appropriate. Think about preferred place of care. And when we talk about preferred place of care, we often all mean different things. So this is another area we need to research in. Um, what do people mean when we talk about preferred place of care? 
When I talk about preferred place of care with families, I'm talking about preferred place of care when the child is well, preferred place of care when your child becomes unwell, preferred place of care when we think your child is at the end of life. So when people talk about looking after a child in preferred place of care, we need to be clear about what stage of an illness are we talking about. We need to think about priorities for the family. How do people want to spend their time and how can we help them to spend their time in the way that they want to? And very importantly, as a palliative care service, we need to be able to offer medical assessment and nursing assessment and symptom management at home in order to avoid unnecessary hospital admissions, but making sure we don't compromise a child's care by doing that. And sadly, some of the children we look after will need to receive end-of-life care. And in these situations, we need to support families to care for their child in the location of choice. There's a real government drive at the moment saying everyone wants to die at home. Well, actually, that's not our experience in our clinical service. Not everyone wants to die at home. Ask me today if I want to die at home, I'll probably say yes. I actually think I don't. But I might say yes. Ask me if I'm feeling really ghastly. And I might say no, I feel safer in hospital. Different people make different choices at different times. And we need to make sure that we're listening to what families want, not presuming that home is best and hospital is a failure, because that's how lots of families are starting to feel. When we're thinking about choice and place of care, families need to understand <coughs> what they're facing. Thinking about signs and symptoms, how to manage symptoms, um, who's going to manage symptoms, who's there to help them. They might need support talking to the child and siblings. Some families will want to know what you do when someone dies, particularly if someone dies at home, who do we tell? And some families might want support with funeral preparation. Obviously, emotional, spiritual and bereavement support is everyone's responsibility. It's not just something for a party care team, it's not just something that kicks in once we know that um, condition may not be curable. I think the key point here is to say that it's about the whole family. How often do grandparents get left out? How often do siblings get left out? Emotional, spiritual and bereavement support is for everyone who's living with a life-threatening illness or who's lost a child from a life-threatening illness. And think about bereavement support options. There's not one option that suits everybody. We need to be looking at what sort of bereavement support do families want, what do they find useful and how do we deliver it. Some want general support, some might want specialist bereavement support, some prefer informal groups, and what about sibling groups? We don't yet have enough information about what we should be providing and what's effective. So just read something up from a research point of view. There's a horrendously poor evidence base for symptom management in paediatrics. It's all based on, the majority is based on adult studies. We're working out doses based on our experience from adult patients. We need to be doing more direct research on symptom management for children. We also, I think, need to be looking at delivery of um, treatments that are traditionally hospital-based that we can actually do at home. It's some of those things that people go to hospital for, we could deliver at home. But again, we need to do the research to prove that we can do those things at home, that people want them done at home. They won't do it at home if nobody actually wants it at home. But people, so we need to see, is it doable? Do people want us to do it? And then let's try doing it. Decision making. What are parents and child's priorities in making decisions? You know, how do people prioritise? How do people make decisions? We don't actually know. Um, we need to do some more research into that because actually it's only when we understand how parents and children are making decisions, what their priorities are at different stages, that we'll understand how best to present information to them and actually how we can support them best through the decision-making process. When we're thinking about place of death, we do need to do some more research into where children and families want to be and why do they make those choices. Do people choose to be in hospital because the support they needed wasn't available? Because if that's why they're choosing hospital, then we need to make sure the support they need is available at home. If, you know, we just don't know, are they choosing to be at home because the hospital is actually really horrible? In which case we need to be doing some more work to make the hospital much nicer. So it's very important research with regards to planning service development so that we can actually ensure that if we're offering choices, we can offer real choices and we can honour those choices. So my final slide, just to sum up. <coughs> just a reminder, palliative care really should start a diagnosis. Everybody thinks we're the people who come right at the end. And what, what I find very sad is um, when I meet families 
where their child has come towards the end of life and realised all those services that would have been helpful they missed out on, all those other people who could have brought in. And because I feel so strongly about the involvement and love of the school, I hate finding out they've actually had no contact from the school for a year. And the school are as upset about it usually as the family are. Um, and, there's, and the stuff we could have done. It's about providing support throughout treatment in conjunction with the other services involved and a real focus on good symptom management and practical support. And where curative treatment fails, we need to be finding out how can we best support families to care for their child and their place of choice, and really essentially without compromising the quality of care. So I will end there. I hope I came within the 10 minutes. Um, this is a picture of Louis Dundas, whose family have raised a huge amount of money to support research within our team and also to support some of our clinical tests. So thank you. Have you got any questions? Except the program is very great, actually, that you've all stayed and not run for the train. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.